Good afternoon, everyone. Hope everyone enjoyed their lunch and uh, welcome back to session six, uh, transit multimodal. And we have three great topics, and one of them from our sister organization in South Carolina, the uh, uh, ITE. And we have Shannon and uh, Graham from HDR joining us. And uh, uh, quickly, want a, a, a brief uh, a bio on, on them, and then we move into the next in-person presentations, and then we'll save questions and answer, answers for last. And all of us, all of you joining us virtually uh, on, you, on YouTube channel, if you have any questions, uh, submit your questions on the uh, comment box, and they will read out to our uh, uh, presenters. And uh, with our first topic on the low country uh, transit update from the South Carolina ITE, we have Shannon Meder and uh, uh, Graham Malone. And Shannon is a senior environmental planner with 20 years of experience delivering planning and environmental services for public facilities, including those implemented under alternative delivery. With expertise in linear transportation and transit facilities, her uh, focus includes project management at the project development phase, most often in delivery of NEPA documentation and permitting projects for various public sector grants. Shannon has managed and or assisted the preparation of a mo more than 100 NEPA documents and planning studies, ranging from categorical exclusions to environmental impact statements for state DOTs, local transportation authorities, and municipal clients in South Carolina and a resident of the low country for 17 years. Uh, Shannon is a native, sorry, Shannon is a native Virginian, a graduate of University of South Carolina and a resident of the low country for 17 years. Her husband, Dennis, is a civil engineer specializing in bridge construction and they are proud parents of four young boys, Hayden, Ashley, Logan, Max, and Madsen. In her spare time, Shannon enjoys kayaking, paddle boarding, and fishing and anything that results in quiet time near the water and we miss you now have being here with us i hope you know you have a great time there and our second speaker uh, from also hdr is graham malone graham is a traffic engineer with 11 years of experience in transportation and traffic related projects he is two-time graduate of clemson university all right we got the birdhouse earlier is that the one that got stolen uh, where he received his bachelor's degree in civil engineering in 2007 and uh, where he also received his master's degree with focus in transportation engineering in 2013. He has provided traffic engineering and planning services for a variety of clients, including uh, several, several local municipalities Georgia and, in Georgia and South Carolina, the United States of Army Corporate Corps of Engineers and the State Department of Transportation in Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina and Florida. He is also he's a currently a South Carolina traffic lead for HDR and he's also an adjunct prof professor at the C Citadel University where he teaches introduction to transportation courses for schools uh, evening and undergraduate programs. His role on the low country rapid transit project includes conducting the predictive safety analysis, overseeing the traffic modeling and analysis tasks and concept of operation development for the system transit and single priority network. With that, uh, give a round of applause for our speakers and then I'll turn it over to Shannon and uh, uh, Graham. All right, thank you everybody for having us today. We appreciate being here. Uh, Graham's gonna run the PowerPoint here and he and I will tag team on some of this information for you. So a little bit of background on Low Country Rapid Transit. It is uh, the first rapid transit project in South Carolina. We are certainly um, aspiring to, to get a rapid transit system in our state that, that matches some of those around us in our, in our Southeast geography, Georgia, certainly not, not an exception. So the project has been around for a while. Um, it started with an alternatives analysis that happened back in 2014. And that study was undertaken by the local MPO, which is the Berkeley, Charleston, Dorchester Council of Governments here in the area. And they really embarked on an analysis with that study to really determine what type of mass transit might be a good solution for the region here. 
Um, the population growth in our region is three times the national average. We have a lot of really, really um, escalating issues with roadway congestion and we are learning very quickly over the past several years that widening the highways just isn't the solution. And in addition to that, our local sales tax option here in Charleston County, in Charleston County, South Carolina, decided to include a uh, referendum for transit on the most recent sales tax referendum. So that really gave some local funding behind this initiative and the outcome of the alternatives analysis back in 2014 really recommended bus rapid transit as the preferred mode. They did look at light rail, they looked at several other options, but the flexibility of BRT combined with uh, the return on investment for that type of a system really, really led in the direction of that recommendation. So we find ourselves today uh, working through the project for BCD COG, HDR is the uh, consultant that's leading the project development phase of the project. We are competing for some federal funding for the project to match the local funding that's going to be provided by the local sales tax. And so in order to do that, we are uh, competing in the New Start program, which has some timelines and requirements on it that I'll talk about a little bit later. But we've essentially gone through and picked up where that early alternatives analysis left off and refine the alternatives and come up with a recommended route and so you can see here on this slide that our project is approximately uh, 22 miles in length. It will run from an area uh, just north of Charleston called uh, Ladson. And there is a fair, an existing fairground there where we'll have a new park and ride. And then it'll travel along US 78 and down US 52 into downtown Charleston with an in terminus in the hospital district um, in downtown Charleston for those of you that, that may be familiar with the area. Along that 22 mile corridor, we do have 20 stations along the way, which you can see called out here on the slide. Three park and rides, I mentioned the one at the beginning of the alignment. We also have one in the central portion of the alignment and then one downtown at the end of line. We're looking at a 60 minute travel time end to end on this project um, with the service and then service every 10 minutes during the peak. You see a pink line here highlighted on the northern side of the slide going from the Exchange Park into Somerville. That's where we're going to have some local bus service uh, through existing service called Tri-County Link that will be able to get folks from Somerville to the LCRT system there at the Exchange Park. So that is an aspect that's being handled locally and coordinated locally with the federal project. And then really what drove the, se the selection of this alternative in addition to um, being able to kind of navigate some of the design challenges that you'll hear about a little bit later and, and maintain travel time and reliability was that it really, it really hits the major employment centers and the major destinations that a lot of people traveling in this area, both uh, those that live here and those that may travel here, want to go. Uh, so we think that this is a really desirable route, um, both, both technically in terms of meeting all of the FTA requirements, but also in what people are looking for in, in an option to their car. Some of the stats on the project here, I mentioned that it's uh, right at 22 miles, about 21 and a half there, um, one way, 20 stations, service every 10 minutes. We're looking at about a 20 second stop at each station, that's on average, and, and what we factor in is our dwell time for the service, but certainly, um, you know, that, that, could, that could be a little bit longer, or a little bit less, depending on uh, what's happening with passengers getting on and off. We're estimating just over 2 million riders annually, and the service is going to virtually operate um, most of the day, just about 20 hours um, throughout the day with time to clean and service the system outside of that. We do have park and rides along the system, one that is new and being proposed as part of LCRT. There is one existing that's central to the corridor and then another that's being planned and funded by others that's in the downtown area. 
so three total along the route. We are looking at battery electric vehicles. We are planning for 19 buses total in the fleet. We'll need 14 to make service. And we're looking at 60 foot articulated buses, which can accommodate around uh, 90 passengers maximum. And then from a technology perspective, and we'll talk a little bit of, about this as well, we're looking at transit signal priority on the system, as well as uh, digital signage at the stations that produce real-time information for passengers. We're also adding some bike and pedestrian enhancements and facilities along the corridor. If you were to travel this corridor today, you would see that it is largely without a lot of pedestrian facilities. It is also an extremely unsafe corridor in general, and we'll talk a little bit about that as well to give you some context. But once this project is put in place, in addition to the transit guideway and, and the other features associated with the system itself, we are putting in uh, just under 18 miles of shared use path that will have some connection to some existing as well as planned uh, pedestrian facilities in the, in the area. We're putting in about eight and a half miles of new sidewalk and or reconstructed sidewalk in areas where that is needed. We're adding 34 pedestrian crosswalks. We do have a couple of areas that have as many as five miles without any crosswalks whatsoever. So this is uh, a major improvement for this corridor. And then we're also uh, able to recognize 1.3 miles of, of dedicated bike lane in the, in the system. We are uh, making some improvements at intersections as well for bikes and pedestrians. We're looking at upgrading the ADA ramps uh, throughout the area, making sure crosswalks are visible. We have a couple of pedestrian scrambles that we're proposing in the downtown Charleston area where there are a lot of really heavy pedestrian movements. And then we'll be making some lane configuration changes and improvements to, to help travel reliability throughout that part of the corridor. In terms of the stations, uh, stations will, um, will be um, designed to have weather protection. I mentioned real-time information at the stations earlier. It'll have level boarding so that when the bus pulls up, it'll actually be level boarding with the station to make it easier for people to get on and off as well as people that may be in wheelchairs or have a stroller. There'll be off-board ticketing as well as of course ADA compliant access and Wi-Fi both on board and at the stations. And then of course we'll have uh, pedestrian amenities and bike amenities at the stations as well, as well as the ability to accommodate bikes on the bus. Just to give you a little bit of a glimpse of what our stations look like, uh, we do have both side station pairs along the corridor. You can see a rendering here in this image of a pair at PG Street, which is in downtown Charleston. That's predominantly where you'll find the side running configuration. We also have a center running configuration. This is a rendering of Mount Road center running station. You can get a look at what that looks like um, in some of the more urban areas along Rivers Avenue. This is predominantly what you'll see. From a project timeline perspective, um, you can see here on this slide that the local planning really started with that early alternatives analysis study back in 2014. We were then um, entered into the capital investment grant program with FTA, which is what we're working through right now today. We are, we are entering the engineering phase of the project where we'll come to an end of our project development phase, which really has consisted on completing our NEPA document, which we just recently got approval on uh, yesterday, in fact. So that's some, some good news and a good milestone for the project. We completed our 30% design plans about a month ago, so that's been wrapped up. And we're really in the home stretch now where we're preparing to enter engineering with FTA and that will consist of completing a series of readiness documents that will go into an overall application for FTA to evaluate the project to allow it to continue in the new start program and um, move on into final design and engineering, which would be the next phase of work that we're looking at here. 
So I think our next slides here talk about food safety analysis on the project, give you some context about why this corridor and some of the things we're seeking to improve with it, as well as talk through a little bit of the design features. And so Graham, I'm gonna pass it off to you to talk through some of those things. All right, and yeah, thanks Shannon. Um, so you know, Shannon alluded to some of the safety concerns that were present on the corridor uh, today. And uh, we, we actually, way back in uh, an earlier phase of project development, we did a cursory review of crash data uh, using some SCDOT safety performance functions that have been prepared uh, at, at the statewide level. And one of the things we realized and recognized right off the bat is that um, there were large sections of the corridor that had a, a much higher uh, expected crash rate, or they exhibited an actual crash rate that's higher than, than expected. In some cases, it was almost twice as, as high. And so that was an indication to us right away that uh, there was a, a big opportunity to improve safety along some of the routes. And the project team kind of made it one of the goals of the project to try to do that where we can. Uh, and, and a lot of that is being done through uh, intersection reconfiguration, um, reduction in conflict points. There are certain sections where there are a series of medium breaks across high-speed multi-lane uh, highways, and we're trying to close those. We're trying to implement, um, you know, signalized U-turns where possible because a lot of the corridor is very wide. There's a very wide median along much of it, and it presents a really easy opportunity to facilitate uh, high-volume U-turns that are signalized in those locations. We also observed um, some, some trends for pedestrian crashes, uh, a lot happening in those sections that do not have any crosswalks currently. Uh, Shana mentioned a section that was five miles long without a, a pedestrian crossing. And the project will implement those at all signalized intersections and at all uh, station locations. So once we knew that information and that became part of the project goal, we took that into the project development phase and we conducted an analysis where we used uh, predictive methods. We also used heat maps and um, I, I mentioned before the safety performance functions. So that helps us quantify uh, how, what, a, what a benefit the project is, is bringing to the area. So in certain areas we can actually improve crash rates by 20 to 35 percent. Uh, we're doing that by reducing weeding sections, like I mentioned before, removing unsignalized crossing. Uh, there's some unconventional lane geometry on certain sections of the, the road itself as well and doing more with lighting and, and separating modes and getting bike lanes uh, uh, built and constructed. I'll do a brief walk through. The project's very long. I don't want to hit everything, but this kind of gives you an example uh, and an illustration of how many different cross sections there are for the project. So, uh, the, the ones that I'm going to be focusing on today are the ones that actually have dedicated bus only lanes. So while the project is almost 22 miles long, there are certain sections of it that do not have any kind of dedicated bus facility. And you'll see that primarily in the downtown area because uh, space is so constrained there already. You know, a lot of those roads are, are four lanes with no center medians and the lane widths are sometimes 10 or 10 and a half feet. So there's really not a lot of room for adding uh, new lanes that are for bus only purposes. But I just wanted to highlight a few of the, the sections that are, I think would be of interest. And this is in the north end, so this is kind of the starting point of the uh, bus only lane. And uh, there'll be a, a queue jump into and out of the transit lane, which is in the center there. So you'll see that primarily the project has center running bus only lanes, uh, with one exception around uh, uh, an interchange that we'll, we'll see here. But uh, this, you know, is, should give you, if you have any idea, you know, how TSP works, which is transit signal priority. Um, or any of these dedicated bus lanes, you should realize that there is a strong need for that kind of technology because what that can do is that that can uh, insert signal phases into the signals so that the bus can either enter or exit depending on which direction it's traveling. It can also hold buses back because you'll notice in this uh, slide, if you, can, if you can tell, there's only one lane for the bus in this area. So this is a bi-directional lane. So there needs to be some way to control uh, both buses, with one is traveling northbound and one is traveling southbound, and give priority to the bus that arrives there first. Uh, this is moving down. This is the location where the, the bi-directional lane transitions into uh, one-way lanes. You see, we picked this up and we tried to have one-way lanes uh, 
to routes most of the corridor where there's bustling because that reduces crash risk. It also improves operations and, and simplifies operations. What we have here is a queue jump phase, so that gives the bus a brief green uh, time before uh, traffic on the uh, general purpose lanes gets to go, and that allows the bus to get out in front of any of that traffic, move into the appropriate lane uh, without any uh, risk or conflict. Uh, this is a, an example of a location where there would also be a queue jump from two interior lanes to two exterior lanes. I mentioned before, there's a brief section through one of the interchanges on the north end of the project where uh, just due to constraints and due to the configuration of that interchange, it makes more sense for the bus to operate on the outside edge. Um, but what this does then is it has to, it requires us to uh, insert those queue jump phases into the signal timing when a bus is arriving. And um, this, this is an area that we've been studying uh, in traffic analysis because those queue jump phases, while they're only, you know, seven to ten seconds long, they can have a significant effect on the traffic operation of those, those signals where they're occurring. So that's something that we've been uh, reviewing and, and trying to refine and, and continue to do as the project enters its engineering phase. Uh, moving down, this is uh, just, it's a little hard to see what's going on here, but this is a really high volume, major signalized intersection on the corridor today. This is the intersection of Rivers Avenue and Remount Road. And uh, you can get a sense of just how big this inter intersection is today. It's at grade, it's eight phases. And what the project is proposing to do would be to convert this to a, a calling it a hybrid R-cut or uh, median U-turn uh, intersection. And when I say it's a hybrid, it, it's got elements of both, so you can still take a left turn from the major street, which is which is Rivers Avenue, um, and you can still travel through the intersection from the side street, uh, but you cannot tr you cannot turn left from the side street. The left turns from Greenmount Road will have to make a right turn, uh, travel down. Uh, Five to 700 feet, uh, depending on the direction, uh, enter a U-turn lane and make a signalized U-turn to go back uh, the, the direction that they were intending to travel. And this has a very significant impact on the operation of this intersection. This intersection is, is functioned poorly today, and uh, our analysis indicates that this is going to be a market improvement for this, this area. We're also installing pedestrian crossings here. There are currently no pedestrian crossings across rivers now. Is, is uh, much needed. Uh, there will, will be two stage crossings because this is a very wide, uh, wide road. And with the bus uh, stations being in the median, it'll make sense for those to be two stage. Uh, most people are going to be going to the center median, not crossing the entire uh, road. And as we move further south, uh, the right of way does. Uh, narrow down a little bit, we're still able to install center running lanes. Um, this is an example of uh, an accurate rail crossing that's currently uh, present. You can see on kind of the lower right hand corner of the screen, there is a rail crossing that exists today. And this is just an example of uh, another use of, of TSP controlling the bus uh, as it crosses those, uh, those accurate rail. Uh, tracks just like uh, uh, vehicles are controlled. And then on the southern end, this is where the bus leaves the uh, bus only lanes. And from this point south, everything is uh, just in mixed traffic. There will still be TSP providing some benefit for uh, travel time, but uh, the, the space is not available for uh, any bus only guidance. And I will mention too that in the line stop, um, this is Line and Haygood, and this is an area that is near the medical uh, district. There's three uh, major hospitals in the area. There's the VA hospital as well as two private, uh, or excuse me, two, uh, two state hospitals. And there's also a, a very um, large plan development that is uh, going in, in here in phases called the West Edge. And um, this is 
that at the end of the line, there's going to be two platforms. So one will be for loading and unloading, and then the other will be for opportunity chargers so that the electric vehicles can recharge and complete the route in the uh, northbound direction. There's also local bus transfers here and uh, transfers to shuttles for uh, medical employees. There's a, you see the parking lot in this image, that is a, a, a hospital employee parking lot, and there's shuttles that run through there um, throughout the day. So switching gears a little bit, talking about traffic signal and, and TSP, um, this is still being developed, and so we're currently working on a concept of operations for the ITS network that's gonna need to be in place for the TSP to function. Uh, we're, we're evaluating a both a centralized and a decentralized or distributed system. Um, we are planning it for 20.5 miles, the, the 21 and a half mile uh, corridor. So almost entirely, there are a few areas where it, it doesn't make sense. We have 56 intersections with TSP. And primarily looking at the early, uh, early return or uh, early green phases with a few exceptions where there will be some queue jump phase inserts as well. Um, and uh, the, the primary driver for the transit signal priority is schedule adherence. So we want to make sure that, um, you know, this is, this is intended to be a premium service, premium transit service. And so the reliability of the bus is very important to its riders. We want to make sure that, you know, when we say it's going to have a 10 minute headway, that it actually has a 10 minute headway. So that is really the, the primary goal of the TSP is to uh, maintain that uh, throughout the day with the variability of the traffic. Uh, we have two different uh, primary systems we're looking at. So there's a continuous type of system, which is, means the transit signal priority is always on. There's also a conditional system, and so this is specified parameters. And you know, like like I was saying before, you know, this may be a set of parameters where there's information on the bus that communicates back to the uh, traffic management center that says there's, you know, 80% capacity on this bus, or this bus is 80% full. And this bus is operating during the peak time, so this bus needs to be granted TSP. There may be other times when, you know, the bus may only be 10% full. It's an off-peak time, and there may not be that big of a need to implement TSP or to allow TSP. TSP. So there's some conditional uh, uh, logic that's going on within the, the system, and that's the prime. That's what we're going to be going with. We don't want to implement something that's always on. Uh, we want to be able to have some variability and be able to have some control over it. For those of you who are, are, are wondering what is TSP and how it works, it's, it's called transit signal priority. And really, it is essentially logic in the traffic signal controller uh, that is taking information about a bus's location, uh, how far it out, how far out it is from that signal, and when it's likely to arrive during that signal cycle. It has the ability to request an either an early green or a uh, red truncation. So what that means is. If you're kind of looking at this following along, the bus is arriving towards the end of that normal green phase, the bus will ask for 10 additional seconds of green time, the signal will run through the conditional logic, grant it, and then take that time from other phases in the cycle. And the alternative to this is if the bus arrives when the signal phase is red, the, the logic will take time from to give back to the main line. So it's just looking at you know the, the location of the bus and um, trying to make decisions based on whether to end uh, phases early or not. We're doing a pilot program right now on a, a parallel road uh, near the project and that's going to be used to better understand uh, you know, some of the specifics of TSP, it's the state's first, uh, you know, ITS network that is going to be able to run something like this. So there's a lot of uh, things that, you know, we want to work out and we, the decision was made to do it as a pilot program so that we can kind of work some of the kinks out before it moves on to the actual main project. So they're really trying to understand uh, how TSP is going to function and what its effect on, on general purpose track. And I mentioned this is the last two slides here. We're looking at two different uh, systems right now. One is a distributed system, and the other is a centralized system. And uh, this really is 
just the, the main difference is in a distributed system, there's a piece of equipment on every bus that knows that bus's location and knows information about that bus and is communicating primarily by GPS. So there's a couple of other methods that it can be used, but primarily through GPS to a, a corresponding device in the signal controller cabinet. And so there's, there's two-way communication between those two devices. The other, I don't know why I keep doing that, but the other um, network is a centralized network. And this is more of a long-term goal for the project. Um, you know, it, it, it's the hopes that one day there will be a centralized co-location uh, for both transit traffic uh, management, and that can house uh, a system, uh, a server that can run TSB. And so with this type of center-to-center uh, -center communication, there is no equipment on the bus. The bus is just communicating back to a transit and passing through this management server to the traffic management center, and the decisions are being made at the traffic management level rather than at the control level. And there's benefits and pros and cons to both. Uh, some will, the, the centralized system is more flexible. Uh, it can be uh, more costly up front, but can have uh, less cost over time. Uh, but a distributed system can be rapidly deployed uh, fairly quickly. Um, and in a lot of cases, the infrastructure is not in place to do something centralized at first. But that concludes our, our presentation on the project. I hope you guys found it interesting. And um, we put our, our contact information here if you have any questions. Um, or if you want to share any lessons learned from any projects you may have worked on, um, you know, we, we, we'd love to, to talk about that and, and I, you know, probably talk for hours about this. So um, please reach out if, if there's a, anything of interest or anything you'd like to share with us or if you have any questions about the project. Jen, anything? Yeah, just one point of interest. I did pop a note in the chat for everybody if you haven't seen it. We do have a really great visualization of the system on our website. We were going to attempt to play that for you all today, but we weren't overly confident we could get it to work over Zoom. So please check that out if you have an interest. It's lowcountryrapidtransit.com and there's a button titled Explore the System, which will take you straight to the video. Great. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Shannon Graham. And uh, also want to give a special shout out to Kelly Patrick with Cobb County DOT for reaching out and making, making it possible for two of you to present. So stick around and then we'll have, uh, if, we have if we have any questions, uh, we'll uh, you know, read it out for you and, uh, and I, I'm, I'm going to move on to the next, uh, our in-person presenters on the Summer Hill. Uh, bus rapid transit. Uh, can you, Christy, help me? And we have two speakers as well. Uh, uh, Juan Duarte and Marsha Anderson Boma, and uh, presenting on the Summer Hill Bus Rapid Transit. And uh, I'll introduce Juan first. Uh, Juan is a senior traffic engineer with Kimberly Hall. He has more than 18 years of traffic engineering experience which that combines extensive involvement in complex traffic signal oper pro operations projects with system management and traffic modeling. One is originally from Colombia, South America, not to confuse with South Carolina, <laughs> <laughs> where he got his bachelor's degree in civil engineering at the Xavier P Pontifical University in Bogota. His first internship was helping with the pavement evaluation on the first BRT in uh, road in uh, Bogota, which inspired him to continue his career on transportation field. In 2001, he moved to the United States, the same year I did, by the way, <laughs> uh, to get his master's in transportation at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. He spent 12 years working on, tra on different transportation projects throughout the Midwest before moving to the Atlanta metro area in 2013 and joined Kimberly Horn, the Kimberly Horn team. As part of the SIGOPS, formerly RTAP team, he led numerous efforts, including full midtown and downtown retiming, which improved travel times and speeds during peak periods. By following the multimodal approach, the benefits of new timings extended to pedestrians, bicyclists, and transit users, which included leading pedestrian intervals, bike progression, and transit signal priority. All these efforts and experience in the area brought him to join the Summerhill project team, 
for which he is honored to be a part of. Thank you. And uh, Marsha, she spoke yesterday, so she asked me not to bother reading the whole bio and asked me to introduce her as Assistant General Manager for Capital Programs at Marsha. And Thank you. I'll hand over. Appreciate that. So. Well, hi, everybody. So um, we are going to be very creative in our presentation so that we don't duplicate a lot of what you just heard from the other presentation. And we're going to tell you a little bit about the general area, the route, um, kind of early decisions that we've made about technology. Um, the design is progressing. Kimley Horn was selected March, I believe it was, uh, we went to contract. So they've been involved just for several months, um, but have been making some great progress. Um, they've been doing some uh, amazing workshops and facilitated sessions to really move us along very quickly. And then we're going to talk a little bit about those surprises that you always have when you have a project like this, um, a little bit about the schedule, the budget, those kinds of things. So um, how, uh, well, most of you are from the Atlanta area. So you're familiar with the old Turner Field. Um, I forget what Georgia State calls it now. It has some new fancy name. But the area that goes from the stadium south toward the Beltline, that's the Summerhill, Peoplestown neighborhoods. And then, so the route covers that area and then um, goes north into the, uh, the downtown, the heart of the downtown area. Um, this is part of what's called, more, originally it was called More MARTA, we now branded it MARTA 2040, which is the expansion program. City of Atlanta voted a half cent sales tax specifically for expansion projects, and so this is one of those projects. Um, the, the round trip for this project is just under five miles. Uh, the terminus is right adjacent to the Beltline on the south side also adjacent to the Norfolk Southern Railroad. Um, we are going to be using electric buses. As with the other project, they will be um, articulated buses. And one of the exciting things that has already started happening, and we'll talk to you a little bit more about that later in the presentation, is some new development that's coming. But the route already has some very major trip generators, trip attractors um, along the corridor. So. We already know that there's a strong baseline of ridership, but we anticipate some, some very significant growth. Um, so this is, the, this is the image I flashed in front of you yesterday to tease you to come here to listen to us today. Uh, the, um, uh, the challenge with a successful system is you not only have to accommodate the system, but you hope that you generate a lot of pedestrian activity. So there's a lot of work going on. If you're, if you're not familiar with that area, uh, there's not a whole lot of development from the uh, uh, baseball stadium area south. So it's very, very, um, uh, it's, it's in kind of a very early stage. Uh, some very small uh, housing developments, a few mom and pop types of shops. Uh, so the pedestrian facilities are pretty minimal. Uh, there's a lot of topography that we're dealing with as well. So making sure that we, we enhance the pedestrian access is going to be really important for us. One of the things that differentiates BRT from ART, uh, arterial rapid transit, is the amount of dedicated lanes uh, that you have as part of the project. So we're targeting around 80 to 85 percent of the route being in dedicated lanes. Um, there, there are a couple of sections, particularly uh, when you cross I-20, uh, the, the Georgia DOT sections, where the traffic volumes are so high that they feel they can't give up the capacity to have the dedicated lanes. So this is generally what we expect it to look like. Uh, lane in, there'll be a lane in each direction. This is just one view uh, of that. We, we are uh, in the process of talking about the color paint you would not believe how many shades of red there are. And thinking, thinking to the future, you know what's going to happen. The minute we get the paint down and everything ready to go, AT&T is going to come along and they're going to cut up a section to bury some kind of cable. So you know, we have to think in advance about how are we going to deal with that, how are we going to keep it looking good as well as functioning well. So this is the, the two-way system. 
the this is you. I said the color change. It's your turn. <laughs> we color coded the slides so we know who's yeah. talking. All right. Thank you, Marcia. Hey, we're going to be talking about technology, but um, before I start, uh, I was told that probably wasn't as good as presenter as Marcia is. Not true. Not true. So, Not true. because my English, my accent, seems like I have an accent, so I'm going to do it in Spanish, and since we're going to be talking about technology, all you can use the Google Translate, and you can go from there. ¿Listos? Bueno, empecemos. I'm just kidding. All right. All right, so yeah, so we're going to... For this project to be successful, uh, we need uh, to use all these kind of technologies in different aspects, like uh, transit, transit uh, technologies at the stations. We need to use up, uh, uh, state of the art buses. We need to use uh, transit signal priority, uh, queue jumps, and also communications. Communications, for all this to work, communication is going to be a big part of it. So I'm going to be talking a little bit more about each of these aspects. Uh, Stop amenities. One thing that I learned is that we, we cannot call them stations. We have to call them stops. You know, the stations are only for, for rail, right? So at the beginning, we were talking about, OK, the station locations, and uh, we have to call them stops. So at the stops, uh, there are different uh, uh, features that we are going to have. Uh, there's going to be, of course, a shelter. We are going to have a bench. But they're, they're going to also have like real-time transit information systems that they're going to be similar to the, to, the, to, the, to the rail system. People will be able to tell, OK, the bus is coming in five minutes. So, or I think that they're, they're thinking about having some pole with a light saying, like, if the, if the, if the, if the light is green, maybe the, the bus is approaching or things like that. So ways to communicate with the people. They're going to have uh, CCTV cameras, off-board uh, uh, fare collection, uh, branding. I think that probably no advertisement on the buses, I guess, <laughs> as you said yesterday. That's my dream. So, so yeah, they're going to have the, the, the buses on the station. They're going to have they're going to have their own brand and and public art. So, transit signal priority. Uh, for many people, may think that priority is similar as preemption, but let's forget about that. Preemption is totally different. Priority is just taking away some time from the cross street and, and give you that extra time to, to, the, to the corridor that you want. That can be given in an early green, in an extension of the green, in different ways, an additional phase or whatever. But uh, there are, there are, there is, is, there are total, to, total different things. But there are two types of uh, priority. There's a passive priority and an active priority. The active is the one that when the bus is actually connected to the signal somehow and asking for or requesting uh, additional time. The passive priority is where we use signal optimization. And as part of this, of course, we plan to do a signal optimization, which not only include uh, retiming the signals per the new volumes or the new capacity, because we are reducing a lane. No, we are also going to think about what other upgrades we can do. Like, for example, flashing yellow are upgrades that will allow us to do a lead and lag. Can we do uh, like a, a half cycle, a double stop? Like there are many other things that we can think about that will help uh, to prioritize the, uh, uh, the, the, the the route. So here are some of those. One thing to consider here is that this is not only a corridor. This this corridor will go through a network, a downtown network. So if we say, okay, we are going to prioritize this particular direction, taking away time from the crossing the street. That crossing the street is going to impact probably. The, the opposite direction of the bus once the bus does the loop. So we need to be considerate of that, as well as this area is a multimodal area. Area We have pedestrians. We have, I don't know how many bike lane projects are going to be happening in this area, but we also have bikes. So, so we need to make sure that everybody is being served. That, that's going to be also help the, the project to be successful. To calculate how much time we are going to be giving to the, or extra time during the prioritization, we are going to be considering the volumes, so we are going to be doing some calculations. We don't want to have we don't want to have very long cycle length. Very likely, I would I wish we can maintain the same cycle lengths. If we can maintain the same cycle lengths, which are like lower in general for what we use in Atlanta. Uh, we are going just going to give a few seconds depending on, on the volumes, or if, if the or if the pets are not being covered, we need to make sure that the pets are covered. So we are going to be analyzing that based upon volumes. And the, and, the, and the needed pet time, so everybody gets gets what what they need. And as I mentioned, uh, all other all other strategies are going to be uh, half cycles or double serve, 
or, uh, or flashing yellow arrows that are going to help, uh, help the route. Communications. Uh, I think that this is one of the most important parts. Uh, if communication is not reliable, the system won't be reliable. It will depend probably on what we do on the passive uh, uh, prioritization because there won't be any communication between the, uh, the bus or the signals or even people won't be getting the, the real-time information based upon uh, where, where the bus is. So this is, this is key, and, and, and we are working on a resource sharing agreement between different agencies, GDOT, MARA, and, uh, and the city of Atlanta to see if they can share what is out there or what is planned to be built. There's gonna be different type of uh, 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 communication devices that can be used. Uh, we, we have found that there's some existing fiber that could be used. There are some holes on the fiber that probably we can either uh, uh, construct more fiber or uh, uh, use uh, some uh, wireless ethernet or uh, some cellular modem. So all this will be considered as part of the project. All right, so now design considerations. As I mentioned to, to you, there's a lot of initiatives and improvements are also happening in the, in the area. Uh, pedestrian safety considerations, of course, there's gonna be different locations where the bus might be like put, put in danger, uh, the, the pedestrians, and I'll show you an example later. So we need to make sure that we consider like LPIs uh, or we consider ADA ramps. Uh, I think that if there's gonna be a signal modification, very likely uh, the signal will be also upgraded with ADA ramps. Uh, bike lane projects, uh, as you can see here, like on, on, on the, the graphic on the top right hand, uh, that one has like all the bike, uh, bike lane projects that are going to be happening or at least are uh, being planned in, in the area. Uh, we have uh, also uh, new transit, transit only facilities that are being planned. I think that Core Lane and Central, they are thinking about also having a bus only lane. So these are things that need to be considered in our analysis when deciding, even when we decide how much time we can steal from the side street, because if the side street is gonna be reduced, the capacity, I, I probably won't be able to give this much time to the main corridor. So these are things that we need to think about. And many other um, uh, uh, things that happen in the, in the area, like, uh, like special events or developments, uh, or other initiatives like uh, the uh, Share space project that we have with CAP right now on Peachtree Street that where they're reducing the number of lanes. So these initiatives may be impacting the area, so all this will, will, will be considered. So here is, uh, I have a couple of examples of where we are planning on either using a transit signal priority or doing a queue jump. So what you, got, you, what you guys are seeing here is the, the intersections of, uh, on MLK with Forsyth and Ted Turner. This is where the bus will be making the, the, the turn to go back uh, to, um, on Mitchell. So what the situation that we have here is the station will, is on the right-hand side of MLK, and the, that, that right lane is a, is a bus-only lane, right? It, that is being planned to be a, a bus-only lane. So when it goes to Ted Turner, the initial plan is actually to have a, a, the bus making the left turn from the right-hand side. Very likely, of course, for that we are gonna need to have a transit-only phase. But there is also the alternative of what if we use a queue jump at the four-side intersection where we hold on red the, the true lanes for the general purpose and we allow the bus to just shift lanes in front of, uh, in front of the vehicles and, and use the left lane. With this alternative, what I like about that one is that we'll, be, we'll have the opportunity to double serve the left only when the bus is there. If the bus is not there, it, that, that, that will be a single serve left. But if the bus is there and they miss the first, the, 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 the leading left, they will have the opportunity to go on the, on the lagging left. So that way we minimize the, the need of prior, uh, giving extra time to, our, to a specific phase. This is another example where, uh, well, several of you are probably very familiar with the Capitol Square that is fully closed in front of the Capitol building that, yeah, we have been dealing with all the traffic detouring on, on, on Washington. The bus is making a right turn here as well. So now, today, I think that we have three right turn lanes at the same time going, uh, they, 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 they are too marked to be two right turn lanes, dual right turns, but I think that they do like a triple right turn there. So there are concerns with 
vehicles turning at the same time with buses, with the bus. A 60-foot bus, I, I don't think that is how easy it's going to be to make that turn. Oh, and in, in addition, on the southbound direction of Washington, uh, there's going to be, on, on the left-hand side, there's going to be a new bike lane. So Washington won't be as wide as it is today. So there are concerns with this. So here is where we are going to need to very likely have a, a, a bus exclusive phase, maybe have a pedestrian exclusive phase as well, because the pets on, on the on the on the south uh, crosswalk with the dual right turn with the vehicle or with a bus there, like probably blocking the view of, of the vehicle that will be making that right turn, they are they are they are unsafe. So we are going to very likely have to use a, a pedestrian uh, only phase here. Right? That's all what I have for now. Gracias. <laughs> oh, I I, 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 I <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so the thing, so, so Juan uh, alluded to one of our surprises. So we were merrily planning our, our network, and the state decided to close the road between the Capitol and the legislative buildings, which was part of our route. So then we had to go out onto Memorial Drive and, and come around. So it made, it's making the route longer, it changes your operational planning. Then last two weeks ago, we've been going around meeting with different stakeholders in the vicinity of the, the state, the stops. I almost said stations. Actually, some, it, we have, it's our PMOC, uh, our contact at Federal Transit, who for whatever reason has it stuck in his head that we should not call them stations. So it's really hard for us because we also think of them as, as stations. Um, home, the uh, Richard Russell building on what used to be affectionately known as Spring Street, now Ted Turner or whatever, um, Homeland Security said, sorry, but you can't have a stop there. And that's, that stop is really important for some of the adjacent developments, the CIM development and Newport, who are um, uh, building in the Gulch and the old uh, Norfolk Southern building. So, so that was a surprise. We think we found a, a great alternate location for a stop nearby, but not in front of that building. Um, we also found out in the early investigative stages that some of the curbing is historic. It's actually granite from Stone Mountain. So you can't just break it up and throw it away. You have to gently remove it, store it, and then reinstate it, you know, it later in the project. So that's created an interesting twist for us. We, are, we have just selected a consultant to help us put the specifications together to procure a new fare uh, system. Our fare, fare system, uh, even though we've modernized it with an app where you can do payment on your phone, it's really a very outdated system. But the system is not going to come online until uh, partway through the development of this project. So we have to be thinking very proactively about how we're going to um, build something that we know is going to be replaced you know, very soon after. Um, and I don't know how many of you have heard about the Five Points Transformation Project. I've talked about that in a previous presentation. But we just selected the architect and engineer. And in October, we'll select the construction manager at risk. But that lovely concrete structure that I talked about yesterday is going to go away. And so the, the, we expect a lot of change in the area. We don't expect the construction project to have a big impact on this project, but it could have some because the hauling off of all the materials could have an impact on the operations. And then we're just dealing with a, a, a lot of stakeholders who have a lot of opinions. And uh, so we had a meeting just before this this morning, we had a, a two-hour call talking about little tweaks to our, our stop locations to try to accommodate all the wants and wishes of, of the, uh, the de all the developers and the other stakeholders in the area. Um, we are in the design phase now. Uh, we are um, anticipating a traditional design bid build uh, uh, for the uh, actual route itself. Uh, we have some early procurements for the vehicles and for some of the other technology. Um, and we, right now we have uh, a committed uh, revenue service date of uh, really October 1st, September 30th of 2024. That is in negotiation with FTA at the moment because they want a bigger construction buffer than we've built into. We have about a 200 day 
buffer built into our schedule they want 275 days um, so we're, we're having conversations about how to accommodate that and uh, the budget is uh, always interesting uh, we had a parametric budget when we first started the project in the planning phases we were able to refine our understanding of what the project was going to look like to get to a little bit closer uh, budget we expect uh, in, in the MARTA world uh, the a project goes from planning into uh, implementation at 30% uh, design so we're now Kimberly Horn received the project at 30%. They're working towards 60% drawings. So we were able to refine the cost a little bit at 30% mark. We expect to refine it even more at 60% and, and really try to lock it down by, by the time we get to 90%. We do have a federal grant. We did a very big overmatch, so it's a reasonably small percentage compared to a lot of, um, uh, of FTA grants that so we have about almost just under 13 million dollars from FTA we're estimating that the project total cost is going to be somewhere 65 to 70 million dollars is probably the, the cost and with that um, oh I did want to make one comment the previous speaker said something about the flexibility of BRT we, we have a different attitude toward BRT you're building you're building stops or stations that is a, a lot of infrastructure that you're investing in, and it's important that it really be received um, as a, a permanent location because economic development is not going to happen at the same rate, you know, where a, like a bus stop is. You don't get the same kind of effect on economic development as you do with a train station. And so we, we're trying to push the economic development needle toward the um, Toward, more toward the, the train station mentality. So in our world, the BRT is not a flexible system. It is where we're putting it, and it's going to stay there. So thanks. Thank you, Marcia. Moving on to our next presentation on in-town multimodal safety. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> she knows her slides very well. <laughs> uh, our next speaker is Kelly Roberts. She graduated from Georgia Institute of Technology with bachelor's in civil engineering. She's a registered engineer in training in the state of Georgia. Kelly has over three and a half years of safety engineering and design related experience. She aided GDAP safety program in implementing a crash screening template to vet viable safety projects. She recently joined GDAP team as safe, state safety engineering supervisor. Kelly also enjoys chocolate cookie dough, ice cream, and long walks on, on the belt line with her dog, Reginald. Hey, Kelly. Go Jackets. Hello. Okay, good. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. As he just said, my name is Kelly. I am the GDOT State Safety Engineering Supervisor. Today I will be discussing an in-town multimodal project that we did in our safety program, talk about the study itself, and then go on to subsequent project development. Starting with a couple high-level takeaways, crash trends and operational data showed a need for multimodal safety improvements on state routes within the metro Atlanta area. Secondly, this opened the floor for collaboration with major stakeholders within that metro Atlanta area. And thirdly, we have identified specific recommendations that have direct, directly led to infrastructure projects. Moving on to the need and purpose, basically the district was receiving a lot of calls for both pedestrian and cyclist focused improvements within the metro Atlanta area. So we wanted to develop a document to help guide us in this process. Using a data-driven approach, we wanted to help answer some specific questions, such as where do we look? What corridors within the metro Atlanta area had opportunities for these types of improvements? And then once identified, how do we prioritize those corridors? Where do we start? Moving on to the methodology, the first step was to develop a task team. We used members from multiple departments within GDOT, including the district, the TMC, and the general office, including design policy and planning. 
So we needed to define the project boundaries. We identified the Beltline as a major generator for both pedestrian and cyclist boundaries. We also like this um, boundary because it helped keep our study contained. The metro Atlanta is a huge area, so we didn't want to bite off more than we can chew. Um, so therefore, we looked at state routes within the Beltline boundaries that helped serve as east-west and north-south east, north connectivity. Um, this also helped, or sorry, <clears throat> this boundary also correlated with the City of Atlanta Safer Streets plan. So again, continuing, continuing with that collaborative effort. So for this study, we wanted to look at um, design considerations and alternatives that were feasible within the existing right of way. So we looked at things like buffered bike lanes, uh, road diets, lighting, and additional streetscape elements. We also wanted to make sure that we reference ongoing, upcoming, and current studies to make sure that our recommendations aligned with their um, proposed improvements. So moving into the actual pedestrian and bike crash analysis, here you can see a heat map of the ped crashes from 2014 to 2018. And as you can see here, this really validated our project boundaries for the Beltline. As you can see, a lot of it is centered within those project boundaries. And as you can see highlighted on the slide, we have some hot spots that really pop up to us. We have some more denser areas around North Ave, um, RDA, and you can see the pedestrian crashes kind of follow out the Beltline on uh, Donald Lee Howell Parkway. Similarly, here's a heat map of the injury crashes. Again, you're seeing a lot of hot spots in the same areas. Um, we go down here, we have North or Edgewood Avenue popping up and then 10th Street as well. Continuing on, we have the uh, density map for the fatalities for the pedestrians and cyclists. As, as you can see, our analysis did indicate to go further past the Beltline um, on Donald Lee Howell. Uh, although we are the safety program, we do take a look at things from an operational perspective. So we put together congestion scans for all of the corridors which we identified. Here's one example for SR9, also known as 14th Street. So starting lower, you can see north side, and as you move to West Peachtree, that's the closer you get to the interstate. So as you can imagine, the closer you get to the interstate, the more congested the corridor becomes. You can also see we have some congestion peaks within the PM weekday peak hours, which is consistent with people trying to get home from work. So we also looked at things from volume to capacity ratio, and this basically cooperates what you saw on the previous slide. Um, as you start in the corridor along um, Northside Drive, you have a lot more availability. Your volume to capacity ratios range between 0.3 and 0.5, but then again, the closer you get to the interstate around Williams, Spring Street, your VC increases and actually goes over the available capacity. Combining the previous operational data, here is a visual showing the amount of lanes available. Remember, our design considerations were focused on what we could do within the existing right-of-way. So we wanted to see where we had space for these types of improvements. So all of the information that I previously went over, the crash data, um, referencing ongoing upcoming plans, the operational data, those were all summarized in what we called corridor profiles. So this helped answer that second question of once the corridors were identified, where do we start? So this served as kind of our cheat sheet and shows, you know, the current roadway characteristics, volumes, crash, and operational data. So this was the outcome of that initial in-town multimodal study. And this just, again, summarizes all of the potential improvements within the corridors we identified. Um, for those of you not as familiar with the safety program, the crash screening is really the first step in our pipeline to get a programmed project. So as you can see, we have several corridors in the crash screening or ICE, the more pre preliminary phases of our pro program development. And then we have um, some programmed projects and some completed projects. I will continue now to go over the current um, program projects that we have. Uh, as you can see, RDA and Donald Lee Howell Parkway. 
So here is the first one. This is Donnelly Howell. As you can see, um, this corridor does extend past our original project boundaries of the Beltline, but that was dictated by our crash analysis. So for this corridor, there were a little more than 1,900 crashes over the past uh, seven years. And the most significant crash patterns that pop out to us, we have left turn angle crashes. We also have rear end crashes. We have not a collision with a motor vehicle. Those are single vehicle collisions. And that's where a lot of your pedestrian and cyclist um, crashes are being captured. So as you can see, for the corridor, there were a total of seven reported fatalities, and six of those um, involved the single vehicle collisions with bike or ped. So you can definitely see there's a need for that. Here we have the intersections on the corridor summarized both by crash frequency and severity. As you can see here, the first four intersections are all signalized. Um, makes sense they make signal warrants have larger volumes, so it makes sense that they would have um, more crashes in terms of frequency. And then as you go down to the bottom table, you see them separated by severity. So the first seven intersections, the top seven intersections in terms of severity are unsignalized. So they, even though they have a lot less crashes in terms of frequency, they're much more severe. So we wanted to really take a holistic view of this da data to come up with important um, improvements. Here you can see those ped and cyclist crashes being broken out. Um, so we have a lot of our pedestrians being hit crossing the roadway, not necessarily within the sidewalks or crosswalks. So um, Now I will go into the specifics of the crash data for this corridor. We put together crash diagrams for the entire corridor, but right now I'm just gonna highlight three of the intersections that we went over. So. This is the first intersection at Church Street. This ranked number one in terms of our crash severity for the corridor. Um, as you can see in the middle here, we have just a really high volume of left turn angle crashes. And then as you can see, we also have some pedestrian fatalities, additional pedestrian injuries, and a cyclist injury. So this, given the left turn angle crashes, the pedestrian crashes, we really want to make sure that we decrease the amount of conflict points to help reduce crash severity and frequency. So moving down, we have the intersection at Hall Street. This was the third intersection, uh, ranked third in terms of crash severity. And you can, again, see those left turn angle trends. You have a lot more rear ends um, on the eastbound approach. And then highlighted here, we have those continued pedestrian injury and fatal, fatal crashes. Here we have the intersection with North Eugene Place. Um, this was the number seven intersection in terms of both frequency and severity. So a lot more crashes. Um, again, we see the pedestrian crashes, five, one, not necessarily happening within the pedestrian um, accommodations as was shown on the table earlier. So of course, we always have to vet everything from an operational perspective as well. You can see both the build and no build scenarios for the AM and peak and peak hours. And you can see for the build scenario, there is um, a decrease in the operational efficiency of the corridor. But that being said, the safety improvements outweigh those um, operational impacts. With the study, we also did ICE, um, intersection control evaluation. So this just takes into account um, crash data, operational data, and um, helps us determine the most appropriate control for the intersection. So in addition to doing the road diet, we also wanted to make sure that we were improving all of the intersections around the corridor. And kind of putting all of that together, we land at our safety BC. We are a benefit cost driven um, program. And just for reference, anything with a 5 BC is considered competitive within our program. So we have an extremely healthy BC for this project at around 70. Um, and now I will quickly show some of the layouts that were with that. Um, this was that first intersection we talked about, Church Street, the number one in terms of crash severity. So 
As you can see, we are doing the road diet, one lane in each direction with a center two-way left turn lane, as well as including a raised concrete median to further help reduce the conflict points of that intersection. So that should target those left turn angle crashes. Um, it should target some of the side swipes we saw as well. And then we also had some pedestrian crashes. So installing that raised concrete median to helps add some refuge for the pedestrian and create more of a two-stage crossing for them. Here's an intersection where we installed an R-cut. Um, as you can see, this is what Rockwood Ave comes in as a very significant skew. So again, just being focused on reducing the amount of conflict points and increasing the safety for all users on the corridor. And then moving on, we have RDA Boulevard. This is SR139. As you can see, this is much more within the boundaries of the Beltline. Similarly, tons of crashes on this corridor. We have over 1,600 crashes, and we are seeing the similar trends with those left turn angle crashes, with the rear ends. We have a lot of same direction side swipes. And again, not a collision with the motor vehicles where you're seeing all those cyclists and pedestrian crashes. So for this corridor, we had a total of five fatalities, and all of those were either pedestrian cyclists or left turn angle related crashes. So the data dictates that this is a prime location to be targeted by a road diet. Similarly, we can see the breakdown by both frequency and severity. Unlike the other corridor, we have a lot more signalized intersections and there's a lot more overlap between the frequency and severity on this corridor. Um, Lee Street is number one in terms of frequency and number two in terms of severity, so a lot more overlap in this corridor. Again, we have um, the breakdown of ped and bike crashes. Here, we have a lot more pedestrians being hit in the actual dedicated facilities. We have, four, at least three, we have 14 pedestrians being hit within the crosswalk. So different types of needs um, provoke different types of improvements. And now, going through the specifics of the crash data. Again, we put crash diagrams again for the whole corridor, but I'm just gonna step through a couple of them. So this is White Street and Langhorn. This was number three in terms of crash frequency and number seven in terms of crash severity. Um, as you can see on this eastbound approach, we have um, 15 rear ends, 11 side swipes. Similarly with all approaches on the westbound, we have 28 side swipes, so, and 34 coming southbound. Again, we can also see we have a pedestrian crash happening in the crosswalk. So, moving along, this is um, SR139 at Lawton Street. This was the number one ranking intersection in terms of severity and number six in terms of frequency. So, again, we have that major left turn angle crash we can see um, in the middle of the corridor. And then we also have pedestrians being hit again within the crosswalk. There is four being hit within the crosswalk, and then we have a couple a little bit further down who weren't using those accommodations, which led to a fatal pedestrian crash. Um, and then you can also see the left turn fatal angle associated with the um, commercial development in the southeastern quadrant. All right, so now we have Lee Street. This was number one for crash frequency and number two in terms of crash severity. And there's a lot going on. Um, it's an existing signalized intersection with brick pavers. You don't have the traditional lattice um, crosswalks. And as you can see, we have a lot of pedestrians being hit within the crosswalks. Again, similarly, vetting things from an operational perspective, you see no build and build for both the AM and peak, in, um, peak hour. Again, there is a small impact on the operations, but compared to the safety impacts, um, it is negligible. And moving along, here's just a summary of our ICE analysis. Um, like I said, this had a lot more signalized core, um, intersections, so more phasing, more leading pedestrian intervals, things like that. And similarly, due to the um, 
magnitude of the crashes, we have an extremely healthy BC of over 100 for this project. So an extremely competitive project for our safety program. And now I will show you some of the build conditions for the crash data that we looked at. So this was one of the locations that had a ton of side swipes. What was it, 15, 11, 34? Um, in all the directions. So as you can see here, we have dedicated through and turn lanes to help reduce um, those weaving conflicts. What was it? It was the 34 side swipes coming southbound. Those were originally two uh, dual right turn lanes, and so we made that just down to one. Um, there was previously a channelized pedestrian crossing. We bumped out the curb to reduce that distance and help make it a safer, safer environment for the pedestrians. And then as you can see on this screen, we have the entrance to the belt line um, to the east there, west there. So here just shows the improvements on the corridor. This one does have dedicated bike lanes. Um, and with this, like I said, we're doing a lot of LPIs. Um, over to the east here, you can see um, a dedicated pedestrian crossing as well. And then similarly, here was the intersection where we had, was it eight or something, pedestrians being hit within the crosswalk. So putting that down that traditional lattice um, paving to increase the conspicuity of the intersection and pedestrians in the intersection. Um, yeah, so we do have, we did just meet with the city regarding these plans and they are all on board. We have a couple revisions because they have um, some local bike lane projects. So still continuing that collaborative effort to make sure that our plans align with um, the stakeholders within the Metro Atlanta area. And this um, study actually did win the Blinky Award for Innovation and Safety. Um, it also won an internal GDOT award for team collaboration, so a huge collaborative effort um, on the GDOT part. And then just kind of bringing it all back, um, the crash data operational trends show that there was room for improvements, pedestrian and cyclist focused improvements within the existing right of way. This gave us room to collaborate with the major stakeholders within the metro Atlanta area and our subsequent collaboration has led directly to infrastructure projects. And without further ado, I'll open the floor up for questions. Thank you very much. Just a reminder, if you have any questions from the audience or from the YouTube channel, enter and then if you're speaking questions here, come to the mic, please. So we do have uh, we do have one question um, from the YouTube live um, for Kelly, and it was, "What data sources did you use for crash data?" Hello. Oh. Hello. Okay. Great. Um, we used GEARS, Georgia Electronic Accident Reporting System, which has all of the um, police uh, reports available. So we were able to also verify the project data or the crash data because sometimes police do not code things appropriately. So we used um, that main database and we also did verify those through the police reports. Thank you. Any questions from the audience? Standing between them and the beach. What is the competition, Dan? <laughs> they left? <laughs> this is for Marsha. This is not a, maybe this isn't related to the bus rapid transit, but you're putting bigger buses on for bus rapid transit. Are y'all thinking of doing smaller buses? I mean, I just moved in town and those big honking buses you got have a hard time making it around the small radiuses. What's the thought behind having giant buses on small routes with nobody on them when you could be running stingers around the city? Is there so, a... So you're not talking about the Summerhill route, you're talking about... Right, just in, just in general, yeah, so lots of curbs oh. getting run over and lots of drains getting broken and stuff like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Hello? Okay, okay this one's on. Okay, thank you. Uh, good question. So we are actually in the process of developing, to do, doing a complete route reimagination. Um, the, um, there are probably places where smaller buses would, would be better. The challenge that we have is there are parameters that we have to follow for our bus fleet size, mix, all, all of that. And um, I don't know that it, it would be cost effective to run regular bus service using small buses because you don't always have a small number of people. And you can't, you know, during the course of the day, you can't swap the buses out. Because I, I question that the Route 39, which is the route from Doraville to Lindbergh on Buford Highway, is a 60 foot articulated bus. And when I go to work in the morning, um, you know, and I, and I sometimes, I've ridden the bus a couple of times because I get on this, the train at Doraville. So I'm curious as to how it works. And early in the morning, the bus is relatively empty. So you say, well, why don't they run a single bus, a regular bus, first thing in the morning, and then swap it out? But they, it's unionized. We can't do things like that. So the union drives some of the, the decisions that we have to make because you have to put a bus on a route and leave it there. And so um, we don't always have the flexibility that might make sense. Hi, um, I am wondering if Marsha and Juan might want to comment on um, potential bus frequencies with the BRT system for Summerhill and maybe more broadly how um, BRT is kind of treated differently in the US versus um, Colombia and some other countries that have more, I think typically more frequent bus BRT service. Yeah. Uh, hello, yeah. Uh, on, um, I think that we are gonna have five buses, right, total. They're gonna be running the, 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 the entire trip is all, almost five miles. And my understanding is that the, um, the gap between buses is gonna be about 10 minutes. Uh, that's the initial plan, I guess. Well, in, in Bogota, it's totally, it's, it's totally different. The, 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 amu the amount of people that carry, that needs to use the transit system in, in, in Colombia is, is a lot. And each of the buses is over capacity all the time. You see people's heads uh, uh, outside of the windows because yeah, they, they, they get full. And so they, they have that on top of capacity. They, and the frequency, I'm not sure what the frequency is. Uh, they built this in 2001 and I moved here, so <laughs> I'm not sure. And I never got to use it at the end of the day. But, uh, but uh, yeah, they, they run a lot of buses there. But yeah, I was just saying, 10 minute headways, that's probably the most frequent service that we'll have anywhere, uh, 10 minute headways. When you get below 15 minute headways, it's when you no longer really need a schedule because people know if they just show up, the vehicle will show up. So it's kind of our first experimental uh, our first toe in the water for that high frequency of service, um, which will certainly have influence on what we do on other routes. <laughs> I'm leading by one question. <laughs> now, actually, it's for our uh, South Carolina participants. I was curious. Uh, with the time frame, if the uh, COVID uh, incident that we went through last year has negatively impacted your rollout of the service? I think I, think I heard that question was for L the LCRT team. And if I heard the question correctly, it was about whether or not COVID had an impact on our, our project. Was that the question? Yes. Yeah. So fortunately, and, and this was not planned, we, we actually did an on bus survey to get some counts to inform a lot of our work in January of 2020. And it was literally weeks before everything shut down. And so we used that data going into things. Um, we've had a lot of conversation with FTA over the past several months as, as we've been going through project development and it's 
it's certainly been a topic of conversation, but um, we've been able to stay on track with our progress and certainly, you know, we were we were operating within a two year time frame to be able to get through our NEPA document and our 30% plan and our request for entry into engineering. So fortunately we've been able to stay on track and, and haven't been as affected as, as some may have been um, with some of the pandemic issues. Just same, uh, another question for you, um, uh, Shannon. With 22 miles and 15 minutes travel time with 10 minute headways, I think this uh, code provides a good opportunity for some good performance measures. What kind of data and what kind of metrics do you intend to use or do you have anything planned to share with us? <coughs> Did, did you get? Did you hear the question, Shannon or Graham? Uh, yeah. Hi. Um, so, performance measures that uh, you know we would be looking at. I mean, it's it's kind of a since it's a new system for the state and for the region. You know, it, the the plan and the vision is to have kind of routine quarterly updates or you know biannually work updates or, or something along those lines to kind of review and, and assess those metrics, but. You know, we're looking at things like, um, you know, schedule adherence, I think is the, the most primary one, um, trying to hit, you know, a, a target, to, you know, and, and that has yet to be set, but, you know, plus or minus, you know, one minute or so uh, uh, would, would be a uh, one that you would typically look at. Um, also looking at um, general uh, purpose traffic, uh, flow, throughput, um, delay, uh, that's one of the concerns um, that has been brought up uh, that, you know, we don't want the transit system to, you know, detrimentally affect general purpose traffic flow. The goal is to try to find a balance. So, you know, we would be looking at things like side street delay, uh, looking at things like mainline delay uh, to try to quantify whether or not, you know, the side streets have been impacted by the TSP or not. And there's going to be some, you know, adjustments that, that go on as the project uh, is, is reevaluated during the implementation phase. Great, thank you. Anybody else dying to ask questions? We may have room for one before we head out. Hearing none, and uh, Robinson asked me to make sure if you signed up for the multi game. It's right at three three p.m. right now, so if you signed up, maybe it's not too late to sign up as well. It's booked up. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, let me read the text then. Make sure I get the. <laughs> <laughs> oh, delayed until 9:30 p.m. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, everybody, and a final round of applause for our presenters.